Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello everyone, this is Nathan. I am currently recovering from my playthrough of Lovers of Ether over the weekend. Anyone who joined us on stream knows what I'm talking about, but if you missed it, I expect a supercut to be released later in the week. So, this week we present another Delve Spotlight, this time for a show that has not officially launched yet. This show is called More Than Meets the Die, and it's hosted by our frequent collaborator, guest, and friend, Dominic Perry from Nine Dragons RPG. On More Than Meets the Die, Dom talks to members of the tabletop community, not just about their work inside of it, but also their interests, hobbies, and passions outside of it. We've had the first couple test pilots available on our Patreon, as well as some bonus material for our patrons. This is one of those episodes where Dom talks to Andy Watson. Andy is the brand manager for Fossa Games, creators of RPGs such as Earth Dawn and Demon World. She discusses the path that led her to Fossa, as well as her life before tabletop. She also discusses her love of video games and dogs, not necessarily in that order. Dom is pretty new to hosting a podcast. This is only the second episode he had ever made, and I think it came out really good. If you like this, please let us know, as feedback is always welcome, especially with new projects. And if you want more of More Than Meets the Die right now, head over to our Patreon and hear his very first episode with Chris Corellis, the kind GM. It's available to the general public, so please check it out. And if you want some bonus content with Dom and Andy, consider becoming a patron. And as always, you can find everything else we do over at Delvecast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and oh so many other podcast services. And you can find us on Twitter at Delve Podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hey folks, and welcome to More Than Meets the Die, where we try and get to know the people behind the tabletop role-playing game industry a little more. Uh, today, I'm very happy to say I have Andy Watson with me. Andy is the project manager for FASA Games, and uh, you can follow her on Twitter at GMAndyJ. That's G-M-A-N-D-I-J. Andy, nice to have you with us today. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you, Dominic. How are you tonight? Yeah, I'm okay. Thank you. It's, um, it's gray and wet and horrible here in Hong Kong, so uh, we're enjoying a day, a day inside. If you don't mind, just to get us started, can you tell us a little bit of how you got involved with FASA and a little bit maybe of what you do? Okay. I fell into this, which is just apparently how my luck works. I actually was going to Gen Con a few years ago with a group of, you're going to love this, Zombie LARP. It was a, it's um, called Ozark Rising. It's a zombie LARP. And as I was going around the dealer's room, getting to know people and talking to people, I made some friends. And then somehow being friends became, hey, we need a GM. You can GM. And me going, um, yeah, I've played Earth Dawn, but I haven't even read Fourth Ed yet. So maybe I wouldn't be a good GM. And they're like, oh, you'll be fine. So I GM'd. And a lot of people actually that played really liked mine. And they're like, you should write it up. You could make it a module. And I'm like, ah, I don't write. And so then it somehow turned into the, we want you to come with us again. And I'm like, and do what? And then I, uh, I became the art director for the Demon World line, which was also hilarious because they're like, come do this. I, I do not art. I make stick figures. I do not art. I make illicit stick figures. Nobody wants them. No, no. See, art directors apparently do not art. Art directors get art. They deal with a lot of contracts. And I'm like, well, no contracts I can do. I understand contracts. And then that turned into, hey, you're doing well with that. Can you help with this? Sure. How about this? Yeah. You should do these things. Okay. Hey, we used to have this position. It was a, it was a neat position. It was called a project manager. And their job was to kind of like stay on top of everything and try to make sure that everything kept in forward motion. You should do that. So somehow within like a year, I went from the art director of Demon World to project manager. And then shortly after that, board of directors. Wow. Okay. So board of directors sounds impressive. Is, is, it, is it as impressive as it sounds? No, there's like three of us. <laughs> Still, that's the, so you've got one third of the power on the board. It's a very minor third, but yeah. <laughs> Mostly it, it, it sounds a lot like 
Wait, how little was the budget again? Curse word, curse word. <laughs> oh, you understand. Small gaming companies, it's what it is. But Absolutely, at, yeah. At least as far as I've seen, a lot of the gaming industry is getting to know people and knowing the right people and making friends and then having follow through. I think that's the the second half of it. It's not just I know someone, it's then if they give you a writing assignment, art, whatever it is, that you actually follow through and do that item. I can relate to that um, from my side of things. The, the minor part that I play in all of this um, tends to be trying to find people to take on assignments. And whilst you may find, or in my experience, you'll find four or five people who say yes, finding someone who says yes and then actually follows through on that commitment is the big deal. It's a whole other thing. Yes. They're the ones you want to hang on to and, and build relationships with because they will. They won't let you down. And the thing is, is they're also the ones that you want to promote when other people say, hey, anybody know? And at the same time, you kind of covet them and don't want other people finding out because <laughs> I, I need the three who actually follow through. This is true. So there you are. You've, you've been to Gen Con. You've made some contacts and you find yourself, as you say, almost accidentally, but I'm sure there's talent involved, but almost accidentally project managing at FASA. Um, but before that, obviously, you, you were a player. So tell us a little bit about your kind of your history of playing oh. RPGs. What do you like? What do I like? I like all of them, for the most part, with a few exceptions. The very first game I ever played was first edition Shadowrun. And I happen to be one of those people who fell into this because of someone else. Again, this was, I was dating a young man and it was something that he was into. So he asked if I wanted to try it one day. It was a horrible first experience overall. Like I don't recommend, they, they wouldn't explain anything. They just kind of told me to roll stuff and they wouldn't tell me what that meant or where it was on the sheet. But what I loved was trying to make decisions. And it's not like video games where you're told you can choose X, Y, or Z. In gaming, pick whatever you want. There's really no wrong answer. I bought the book and I read the book. It made me a lot more fluid. I used to joke there for the longest time that I, I gave up that particular boyfriend, but I kept gaming. Second game I ever played was Werewolf. And I just started a, a lifelong love. Like this is, if I had to pick one fandom I can't live without, it's tabletop role playing. So obviously you started, like you say, you, you fell into it with um, another person asking you and that hooked you. Which actually is how a lot of people get into it, is somebody says, hey, you want to try this? That's, an, that's a whole interesting part of our hobby, actually, is that how do you introduce the hobby to new people and new people to the hobby? As you said, your, your very first experience wasn't necessarily the best no. um, experience. It is fascinating trying to bring people and the hobby together. When playing, I'm very much co more comfortable being a, a GM. I I don't know why it's, I have control issues or something. And I know people who never want to GM. And then there are people who can go either way, so to speak. Uh, what do you think about yourself? Are you more GM, more player? Or are you comfortable with any of those roles? I think that shifted. When I first started, I was a player for about a year before I first tried GMing. And then after I first started, I GMed more and more and more. Four or five years ago now? Probably about five years ago, I was GMing eight different games, not at the exact same time, but during the same time period. Like sure. I would have a Monday game and then an alternate Monday game and a Wednesday game and then the alternate Wednesday game and then the Friday game and then the Saturday game and the Sunday game. And I was GMing all of them and I loved it. At the same time, I find that GMing is a lot more draining than being a player. Mm -hmm. So I've tried to back off of some of my GMing and be a player a little bit more and reconnect with my love of the games in that way. Because I think that the love is different. Not that you don't love it, but I think that there's a difference to it. And part of it is how much energy goes into planning and GMing versus showing up and just going, I'm a player and here are my monkey wrenches. And I would like to throw them with glee everywhere, all over the place. Yeah, that's interesting. I know at the moment I run four games kind of weekly some of them are weekly one of those games you know you're involved in yourself but i, I love that game 
I love that game too. <laughs> I love that game more than I realized I ever would. But I did find myself having a, a minor kind of sort of split personality moment where I was starting to find, I was dreaming about characters in one version of the game meeting up with characters in the other and everything started to become blurred. And I thought, do I need to take a break from some of this? Do I need to step back a little bit? And then I talked to some people and thought, no, I don't need to step back. I just need to enjoy what I'm doing. I think GMs just on a regular basis need to take downtime. I think they do. I think that GMs can totally get overwhelmed. And I think it's easy because we put so much into the games. We put so much time and thought. And part of that is one mitigating putting too much time and thought into any particular game. I, I've given seminars at Gen Con and a few other places on, you know, GMing. And one of the things I notice is people want to put so much into the story. They have this great story and they're going to do this whole thing and they write pages upon pages of all of the story. And the problem with that is, is that players are not mind readers. If you write 16 pages of story, they have no idea what you wrote. They're not going to follow that. And then they get frustrated because they can't seem to keep the players in line. Well, you're not going to. Eventually, I think you hit that stride where you're like, I set some things in motion. I let them do stuff. I reacted to it. We had a great time. And then it's not as draining until you start hitting what you're doing, which is playing, running, sorry, running four, five, six plus games. And then Mm -hmm. you get kind of back into that whole, I love it but it is a lot of energy. I like your philosophy. It it aligns very much with, um, as you know, and listeners may know, I'm a full-time teacher. I work with um, what we we call primary age kids, so mainly seven to 11-year-olds. And as I've, 25 years of teaching has taught me that it's not my job to try and control the learning. It's my job to be the person who guides it and to give those kids as much agency as I can possibly give them. I absolutely find that running role-playing games, the same philosophy works, that if you are adaptive and flexible, as you say, once you've put in the effort, you've set up the reality and you've generated the possibilities, then to let the players run with those. And your job is to be adaptive, be flexible, Mm -hmm. be creative, and roll with what happens. And that's when I get a real buzz, when I see that that happening in a game that the players, the motivations from their characters are coming through and that starts to drive things. Isn't it great when they really just start not just reacting, but creating the story? Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, isn't that what you really want to see? You want to see them doing things that create. I completely agree. And um, I'm happy to say that certainly one of the games that I run, which you're involved in, is, is definitely heading that way. That's the excitement for me. Uh, one of the things we try and do on this uh, this podcast is to get to know people a little bit beyond or sideways of of the role playing world. If you don't mind, just tell us a little bit about um, Andy and who she is and what what your background is and how you arrived at where you are now. Well, I was born in Illinois. I moved to Missouri fifth, sixth grade, something like that. I've been in Missouri the rest of that time. I'm now officially old. I've declared myself old. I'm with you. Makes things easier. (laughs) I'm embracing it. You moved when you were, so fifth or sixth grade, it would be like nine or 10 years old. Yeah, something like that. Was that with um, family work? Yeah, my my father's job changed. He actually had wanted to spend more time at home. Um, His original job, he would be home on weekends and sometimes every other weekend. He worked for the phone company. There's a lot of great jokes about that. So what he used to do is if somebody messed up a phone office or something like that, he would take a team out and they would fix it. So he would travel all over. So depending on how far out he went, he may not be home for a couple of weeks because he's, again, we're talking about how vast the U.S. is. He could be a 20-hour drive away. When we were really little, my um, older brother had been asked what my dad did. And he told the teacher, well, his dad was a janitor. Keep in mind that I am old and sometimes and people aren't always good people. This teacher decided that, you know, janitor's sons don't get good grades and his grades suddenly dropped. And my parents were like, why is his grades suddenly different? And basically the teacher informed my mother that, you know, what do you expect from a janitor's son? And she's like, first off, what would it matter if he was a janitor's son? And second off, 
My husband's not a janitor. They used to always say things like, what does dad do? He cleans up messes. Right. Okay. <laughs> so when we were little, you know, like kindergarten, first grade, you know, what does dad do? He cleans up messes. Well, what he, he does is he fixes literally phone offices and fiber optic lines. And so he, but, but in your view, from you and your, your brother, like when you're little, he was either a janitor or was working for the mob. Right. You know, <laughs> I don't think we knew what the mob was. So pretty much that left janitor. <laughs> At one point before MCI collapsed, he was like the tri-state area head engineer or something. He's retired a couple of different times. He's retired again. We'll see how long this one lasts. He tends to get bored being retired and then try to go back to work. So, so you guys moved from Illinois, this is right, mm -hmm. to Missouri. Yes. You're, you're about 10 years old or so. What happens? How does, how does Andy grow up in Missouri? We were in a very small town, which was very dull. I got very, very bored. Keep in mind, computers weren't really, I mean, like they had computers, but they weren't very common and popular. It wasn't until I went to college that they really started the whole internet thing. And I think you may be old enough to remember this, but it was back in the days of 13.176.2.99. Do you remember those days? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Way right. before this WW8, you don't even have to write the WW anymore. Back in the old days. We've got our internet chops. We remember what it was like. I'm old. I told you. I officially declared myself. So I, I, I graduated. I, I technically graduated valedictorian, but remember my graduating class was 26 people. It was a very competitive 26 people, but there was 26 of us. And I, I went to college. I actually left college in my senior year because I crazily decided to join AmeriCorps, which is like the Peace Corps, but you work inside the U.S. Okay. It was not the best plan I ever had. But it was a plan. It just wasn't a great plan. I meant well. I so thought it was a good thing. It wasn't a great plan, but I mean, it sounds like no. the sort of thing that should have been a great experience. It probably should have, but it was not ran very well, at least where I was at. Okay. Unfortunately, it wasn't the best plan. I probably should have stayed and finished up my degree work, but I had changed majors a couple of three times. I actually went from a teaching major at one point to a community regional planning major because I decided I didn't want to teach children. And then I basically spent most of my adulthood teaching children between uh, tutoring and private teaching. So strangely enough, and usually math, I taught a lot of math. That's, a, that's one of civilization's greatest achievements, mathematics. I'm fully behind you I on that. I love math. I love yeah, math. It's elegant. I'm a math nerd. It's beautiful. And it makes sense of the world, which is... It is. But yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a different type of beauty that not everyone appreciates. Like, I never understood poetry, and I still have trouble with it. Math is different, and math to me is beautiful in the fact that unless you get up into theoretical math, which most people never want to talk about anyways, math is very black and white. It either is or it is not. There's a certain sense of comfort in that, isn't there? It is. There's, there's a certain amount of, I can totally make sense all the boxes are boxes. And if it isn't in this box, it's in a different box. But it's a little rigid, I think, for a lot of people's worldviews. And I think as you get older, you learn that that rigidity isn't how everything works. If, if you're interested, and um, anyone who's listening, if uh, this is the sort of thing that excites you, obviously, Andy and I are both excited about mathematics. <laughs> There's a professor at Stanford University at the moment. She's an English maths professor. Her name is Joe Bowler. Um, and she runs a program at the moment. Stanford is very progressive in maths teaching. And um, I think you'd be fascinated if you checked it out. And anybody who else I is interested so. in that. Look, look for Joe Bowler. She's at Stanford. So that's a sideways thing. So do they have math competitions in Hong Kong? In Hong Kong, we have competition for everything. Everything is I a competition like, here. I feel like we do here. But yes, I had a lot of... Um, math awards like medals i had medals for mathematics i had a medal for accounting i had medals for science fair my letterman's jacket made a lot of noise what um, was the thing i Did we, you guys get medals uh, not so much medals i think i may have got a certificate for trying hard once but, uh, that's probably <laughs> about it for me so in my head now i see uh, i see andy growing up in missouri and she's into school and she's enjoying herself at school you have a good time at school 
what was what was high school like for you? I was very odd man out and okay with it in high school, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Again, it was a small school. There was only 26. I had a couple of friends I was close with and everybody else. We didn't have anything in common and I just wasn't all that interested in changing who I was. So I was just fine with that. We didn't have anything in common. It wasn't really until college that I found gaming and people who were highly into fantasy and all of that type of geeky stuff that I loved. You know, the the wonderful old sayings of, you know, finding your tribe. In in high school, I had my couple of friends and everyone else it was like, yeah, great, whatever. Busy. I feel like we we have a similar kind of time period that we probably were both growing up. And for me it went the other way. I I found the role playing when I was like 12 years old, I got into good old Red Box Dungeons and Dragons and that was it. Me and my friends were obsessed then until I, when I, when I went to university, that stopped. That was not cool. And you, you mentioned about finding the geeky stuff and finding mm -hmm. your tribe. For me, the experience was the other way around. When I was, I guess what as you guys would call it, high school, playing Dungeons and Dragons was fine. We played it and we had other friends as well. You know, it was like not a big deal. When I went to university, <laughs> not cool. All stopped. And I, and I lost it, and then I had to refind it. But did you, what was your experience of, of finding that geek culture? Was it a easy, positive one, or was it difficult? It was. So like I said, I started with a, let's be honest, it was a boyfriend, and he didn't work out. That's okay. I was very in love with gaming, and he introduced me to it, so I will always be happy to have met him because of that. And then I started to meet more people who were into it. And it was, for me, most of the time amazing because a lot of them were like, you're a girl and you want to talk about this? <laughs> like, really? And I was like, yes, I really, really want to talk about this. Let's tell me about this. What do I need to know? It was great. It was such a positive experience with probably 90% of the guys I knew. Yes, back in the old, old days, occasionally you would meet someone Whose girlfriend are you? Well, I'm nobody's girlfriend. Then why are you here? Because I'm your GM. This is what I'm doing today. Thanks for playing, right? That's the best answer, isn't it? Because <laughs> I'm the GM. Because <laughs> I'm the GM. I, my my, my all-time favorite, and it actually is where the joke on my tagline on Twitter is what it is. I've, I've done a lot of off and on working with conventions through the years, too. Because I love conventions. And so I was on staff at this one convention and had gotten, you know, split apart from my then significant other because I was working. I catch back up and he's talking to a vendor in the, the vending floor, right? Mm -hmm. And the vendor's like giving me the evil eye. And I'm like, so what are we talking about? And he's like, well, you wouldn't know. And I'm like, okay, well, you just, you wouldn't understand. I'm like, well, okay, can we at least tell me what it's about? He's like, well, it's about gaming. And I'm like, well, then he's just something or other. I curse a lot. Sorry. Cursing is a sign of intelligence. There's data to support it. So never apologize. So I'm like, well, then he's just blank, right? And the guy goes, oh, are you one of those women who won't let her man game? And I'm like, no, I'm his something or other GM. And if I don't know it, he's just screwed. And the guy just looked at me and he literally looked at me and he blinked. It was like cartoon level blink, blink. But you're a girl. And I'm like, is it the boobs? Did the boobs give it away? Yeah. And he just like didn't know what to do with this. He didn't know what to do with your boobs. No, didn't, didn't I don't think do... so. <laughs> probably probably just they're confusing. As well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think they're confusing. Most of the time I didn't everybody was great. Like it was wonderful. It was very empowering. It was very supportive. I've always found the gaming community to be inclusive and supportive. I mean, I wish that everybody had the same experience that I've had because it's been so wonderful for me. Like I learned so much about myself and about dealing with other people. Honestly, I, I think that that's what caused me to really grow and blossom as a human. It is an amazing group of people. Generally speaking, I would agree with you that 99% of the people you interact with, just nice people who want to have fun. And I think you're right. Very accepting people who want to get to know <laughs> you as an individual rather than try and judge you on anything else, which is so refreshing. 
I look back, as I said to you, when I went to university, I didn't have that experience, but I, I look back now. And if I'm very honest with myself, I'm pretty sure that was also because of my attitude that I felt uncomfortable and um, kind of hid away that part of my personality, which is a shame. Now, when I look back, I think I wish I hadn't done that, but I'm also happy to have got back into all this many, many years later. So clearly gaming is important to you. It is. Apart from gaming, what else gets you excited? What What are your other passions or your interests? My dogs. <laughs> I've seen your dogs. I like your dogs. So tell us about your dogs. Actually, I have three. I have um, a lab rescue who's unfortunately like 14, almost 15 years old. So she is um, health-wise not doing so well in her old age. Other than her, I've got my two papillons, Mr. Cat and Miss Frog. We're okay. actually expecting puppies. Ooh. We're expecting babies. End of this month, hopefully, maybe beginning of April. We have our Delayed. next prenatal a visit Monday. Like we take this very serious. Oh yeah, prenatal absolutely. Visit. Yeah, and Papillon they come out in little chrysalis, do they? And then they do. <laughs> no. That would be kind of cute, wouldn't it? That's a, those, are, those are Dungeons and Dragons monster yeah. we create. So Papillon is because the the up airs when looked from the back, I guess, kind of look like a Papillon, like mm -hmm. a butterfly. Yeah. So Papillon is French for butterfly, oui. and there is a down air version called a Faline which is French for moth. Minor okay. papillons, they have up ears. Oh, because, yeah, because of the way butterflies sit. Okay, mm -hmm. I get it. They're a really neat breed. Years ago, before I got my first papillon, if you had met me, I would have told you I hate little dogs. Like, I'm, I'm not a little dog fan. I don't like them. They're yippy and snippy, and I don't... I grew up raising German shepherds. I get German shepherd to do all sorts of neat tricks. Usually that involves scaring other people, but you can get German shepherds to do all sorts of cool things. They're great. They're hard workers. I like German shepherds. They terrify me, but that, that's a personal thing. I'm, I'm willing but to they, change. They can. <laughs> Actually, you know what? If you know how to handle them, they're fantastic dogs. They do take some knowledge in handling. And in part, it's because of how we've bred them. We've bred them to be a very proactive breed. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is, is that they don't wait for you to tell them to do something. They look at a situation and go, I don't like it. I think I'm going to eat that. Like, that's what they do. We've bred them to be proactive. So when you handle them or raise them or train them, you have to make sure that they're very, very clear that you're in charge, that that's not a questionable thing, that as long as I'm here, my word out goes yours. If they have an inch and they don't think that you're in charge, you don't want that with a German Shepherd. You want them to be very sure that that guy's in charge. I'm pretty sure that any German Shepherd that's met me instantly worked out that I was not in charge. <laughs> Maybe the problem with my interaction with them, because uh, I just see them and think, oh, my God, I'm terrified of you. Please don't eat me. And most so of them they, are yeah. sweethearts. Like they really they're sweethearts. Right. I had actually lost my Siamese several years ago that I'd had since I was like 14. My Siamese was like almost 21 when he passed. Mm -hmm. I was heartbroken for a little bit. And then I decided I was going to get a little dog which is weird, but I wanted something small like my cat that could be in my lap but didn't need a litter box because I actually do not miss the litter box at all. And so I started doing a lot of research into looking into small breeds, and that's when I finally found the Papillons. And what's great is, is that they're the only little guy in the top 10 brightest breeds. They rank 7th or 8th brightest breed, unlike any other little guy. Like, the rest of the little dogs are way further down the list, right? We once had a Yorkshire Terrier. That was uh, my, my wife, Your Jane. Case? She uh -huh. would when I met Jane, fell in love with her and, and managed to persuade her not to get rid of me. <laughs> she, she came with Meg, who was her Yorkie. And yeah, I actually like really loved Meg. She was a cool little dog, but not necessarily the brightest thing around. They're sweet. Yorkies are usually sweet, though. But no, Very they're not the brightest. Very, Very enthusiastic. enthusiastic. Yeah. <laughs> Terriers tend to be high energy. Terriers tend to be not super bright terriers tend to be willful yes that would be about right yes. willful so papillons it's actually written in the breed description that they are happy and outgoing like they love everyone 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 is their newest bestest friend ever even though they just met you just like you yeah I, pretty much and they have no fear either which is a kind of a double-edged sword because they literally have no fear. It almost sounds like you're describing some of the characters 
in some of the role playing games that I uh, involved with. <laughs> well, yes, that that character Remy. did spring to mind. For those of you listening, <laughs> Remy is um, a one thousand and one pound total ninja monk who is a character in the game that Andy and I are involved in. And Remy does sound an awful lot like a papillon. With the description it, that we are getting of. here. He wouldn't sit in your lap, though. Well, he would sit in your lap. He but... would if he could without right. squishing you, but then he'd feel yeah. bad because he squished you. Yeah, Mr. Cat was at a convention when he was like nine months old. Not a convention, sorry. He was at a dog show. We, he was being shown. There was this really big, I think St. Bernard size, but they're a different color. And it's something like, they're like a Russian mountain dog that's supposed to kill bears. And yes. these things were really aggressive. Like, I've never seen a show dog that aggressive before. Like these are very aggressive. So it is just growling and snapping at anything that comes near it. And here's my, at the time, like six, seven pound, nine month old Papillon, who's like, I love you. I will give you kisses. And then you'll love me too. That does not love you, Mr. Cat. <laughs> and, and he's not the size of a bear. So it's not going to be a fair no. fight. No, 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 it's not a fair fight. He he scared the heck out of me, and I had to drag him away and be like, no, that's that's a no. And what did he try to do the first time I had my back turned? I love you. I will give you kisses. You well, you have to goodness. you have to admire his his disposition and demeanor. He's a, he's he has a <laughs> positive do. positive outlook on life. Yeah, this is our our second litter, and one of the babies from the first litter I gave to a friend of mine, so I get to see him all the time. We were out on the deck barbecuing, and the deck is like ten feet up in the air. Well, he jumped off the deck and you're just, you. oh, you cannot believe how much we all freaked out because he was a baby. He was maybe six months old and he jumped off this 10 foot deck. He could have severely hurt himself. Now, in my imagination, had... the ears are now oh, gosh. Oh, elongated yeah. and he's gliding down, but I suspect that <laughs> might not be reality. No. That is not how the physics <laughs> work. And then, then he couldn't figure out why we were all mad at him. He's like, what? I'm having fun. Let's do it again. No. You are in timeout, sir. You go sit in a playpen. But they do. They, they're, they're just great little guys. They're very smart. They're very trainable. It's actually also a very old breed. Like there are paintings of them back in like the 1410s, 1420s. They're a very old breed. They've got some experience behind them. I used to joke that they're SCA approved. Do you know what SCA is? I do not know what them? SCA is, no. It's a historic reenactment group, and I've had friends who do that, where they okay. do the whole tents and all that. So yeah. I joke that it's the only thing I own that's SCA approved. Yeah, so they could legitimately turn up at a battle recreation and not be out of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, there are probably, they're probably stories of papillons running across fields, carrying messages from different gen generals. And Actually? Really? What most of them are for? No, not that. Okay. What actually you hear stories of is is that they were given to different royalty. It was actually a, a a gift that royalty used to give each other, in part because they did not science as well as we do now. So they thought that if you had this little dog, that the bugs would go to the dog and not to them, which is not how bugs work. There is a story about them saving saving like a duke or something. Like someone had poisoned his food and the dogs wouldn't shut up. And that was how he knew something was wrong. Something like that. It was a weird story. But yeah, they're neat. They sound great. And as I say, I've seen photos of your dogs and they're very cool. They're very cool. And again, if I was uh, anywhere nearby, rather than being 6,000 miles away, as I am, I'd be over <laughs> and picking up my puppy as well when the new litter arrived. We've got to know you growing up. We've got to know you. and I'm boring. I game and I play with my dogs and I read comics and I play video games. Well, that's my last... Well, you've just said comics, so clearly you're not boring. Apart from the dogs, you're not gaming. The dogs are off looking after themselves. What is, what's the thing you do to try and just relax and chill out? Lately, I have started... Because I've, I've, I've played video games. I just don't do it well. Like, I'm, I'm actually really hideously bad. And so... I lately have gotten talked into trying streaming video games, to which I was very concerned because why would anyone want to watch me do really terribly poorly at this? But I have found that I really like streaming. It's interesting. Like, I'm playing the video game, but I get to talk to people, and they interact and they talk at me while I'm playing the video game. And it's strange. It's, it's not like being at a convention where, like, 
you feel like you're on and you have to be projecting the correct energy and carrying on a seminar or panel. It's not like that. It's it's kind of just like hanging out with friends, chit-chatting while you're playing the video game. Lately, that has just been great fun for me. And that's on Twitch, right? Yeah, I've been doing it on Twitch just not for very long, but for a little bit. I, I tried, I've, I've been playing Skyrim. I've not been doing it very long, but I already have apparently an official death counter. Yeah, that's a thing. Okay. I die a lot, so apparently I need <laughs> one. I died a lot today, especially. They've set me on a, a, a course of action I've never done in Skyrim. I'm I'm sneaking and trying to hit things with bows, and they had me join the Brotherhood, and I am really bad at all of this. I have been basically caught with every assassination attempt. I'm stuck in this Dwargar heck, and I'm getting my tush handed to me, and I keep dying. And I'm I'm picturing you almost as a Papillon assassin. A lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> Maybe uh, not picking your targets as smart. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, literally. So the the first of the Brotherhood three things that you have to kill, they they give you these three assassinations. I get to the last one, and let's see. I accidentally shot a guard because I didn't realize that it was the guard and not the person I was supposed to kill. That involved in running and fleeing because the guard was chasing after me and mad. Um, then I shot somebody apparently who was named as Carl, which started all sorts of Carl jokes. That also was not the target. I actually, I actually saw you do that. I must admit, I sneaked did on. Did you? I did. Oh, I you're kidding! Checked out your your video, and I I picked <laughs> a random spot in the middle to watch, and I saw you sh- attack and then apologize <laughs> to somebody. So yeah, I I saw that. Apparently, part. apparently that because he's not the target. Then I kept trying to shoot the actual target, and every time I swear I got caught. And so then, like, one of them, I'm like, okay, what do I do? Because I got caught. And they're like, just go to jail. Okay. So I went to jail. They're like, okay, break out. So I have no equipment, no clothes, no nothing. And I'm trying to break out. And, of course, I get spotted. And they they decided I was in what they're calling a death loop because I would just respawn right as they're killing me again. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm in a staircase and there's nowhere for me to go. Right? (laughs) Like. So yes, I I I'm very bad at this, but thoroughly enjoying it. I have been enjoying the heck out of it, and again, I've had such a good experience with the community. Like people have come on and they've been very supportive. And even though I'm I'm really bad at the game, we're all laughing and having a good time with it. I'm I'm loving it. But I will say I'm also the same person who played Tropico Five and was on Sandbox with unlimited money at the easiest settings and still ended up basically dying. They laughed at me a lot. <laughs> so you're bringing joy and humor to other people through your own... Th- through laughing at me, yeah, with me. There you go. Laughing yeah. <laughs> with you, yeah. Laughing with at you, me with me. Yeah. Yeah, like, la- <laughs> laughing at you at the same time as you laugh with you. Yeah, oh, I, get it. I get it. Come on, if you watched it, then you saw how bad I actually am. It's pretty I did, funny. I did giggle. Um, okay, come on. It was it was good. I also I thoroughly enjoyed the reaction of the other person who could not stop laughing at what was going on. Um, so <laughs> oh gosh, whole... oh Alex, yeah, uh, yes. Pink Demon Alex yes. was on with me, and I don't know if she's laughing at me or the comments and the thing, but yes, <laughs> she was enjoying herself. Whatever she was laughing at, it was it was fun to listen to. Um, I will say, if you're looking for that whole, like, serious, like, competitive gaming spirit, I don't have it. <laughs> Good. I I like that. Do you play? I do not. I, I do not play anything um, really? online. Well, what about offline? Uh, not really. I mean, a little bit. I just started. Stuff. I mean, I played Skyrim offline a lot before. My son plays these games, and he tries to explain to me, and I become baffled. Yeah, and I go, now I'm going to go and read my comics because but they, they don't confuse me. All right, what comic do you read? Favorite comic? Uh, which, is, which is what I was going to ask you, but yeah, I'll tell you. Um, currently, uh, I'm reading Saga, Brian Vaughan and Fiona Staples. Amazing, fantastic series that's been running a while now. It's very well known. A lot of people listening will probably already have known that. Um, I have also been reading a lot of or trying to find um 
comic versions of any of Michael Moorcock's stories and writing. Oh, so I, I love just his read... books. Yeah, and I've Elric series. Yeah, yeah, I read. The, the, there's a bunch of Elric. There's some Corum stuff um, in comic form, um, and then the other thing I have been reading <laughs> recently, uh, I read the Critical Role Origins comic series from from the Vox Machina characters which um was interesting actually comic wise that's what i've been reading um what about you any recommendations for people anything that oh and the other thing sorry one more, one more thing I'll, I'll say sure uh paper girls i don't know if, if you've seen that paper girls i have not fantastic i'll have to look it up really really worth looking yeah paper girls i love it anyway uh, what about you any comics you can point us towards i, I have some very traditional batman deadpool you know, I was always a fan of Wolverine until the whole Magneto took his adamantium and I really hated the whole feral Wolverine BS and then they gave it back and it was better again. But one of the, the newer, less, I guess, mainstream, but maybe it's not that far outside of it, is this really interesting one called I Hate Fairyland. And it's very brightly colored, like. I mean, like eye popping, psychedelic, brightly colored type of thing. But it's about this little girl who, you know, supposed to be going on a fairyland adventure, but she gets trapped in fairyland and hasn't been able to find her way out. And now she's been in there for like 30, 40 years. So she's still trapped in this little girl body, but she's like a 30, 40, six year old woman. Mm-hmm. And she drinks and smokes and says horrible things. And it's, it's definitely not for children. Okay, I love the sound of that. I have a very weird fascination with especially dark fairy tales. Mm-hmm. Like, did you ever see American McGee's Alice? No, I didn't, no. So it I was a video it. game, and they did a second one, Madness Returns. But it was a very dark idea, like this girl's parents die in a fire, and she's in an asylum, and Alice is... A, is dealing with the death of her parents and being stuck in the asylum. And that's part of the escapism to Wonderland. It's a twist on a, a dark twist on Alice in Wonderland. Which is fairly dark in, 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 when you get into Alice in Wonderland. It is. The original is, has its very dark moments when you actually look into it. But yeah, that sounds good. So one recommendation, what was it called? The comic? It's, it's called, I hate fairyland. I think it's done. Like, I think I'm behind. I've been picking them up as the uh, the graphic instead of the individual comics. I pick them up as the they they're just easier on my bookshelf that way. I don't know about you. Yeah, I I, I do the same thing with saga. Well, I unfortunately for my finance, I buy the individual thing, and then I feel compelled to buy the volume when it's released as well. I've been being very good and very strict and only buying the volumes. I actually I, I think I need to look at this uh paper dolls one for when I finish this because I should be done with this. I think Paper Girls. Paper Girls. Paper Girls, I'll write it down under um Joe Bala at Stanford Math. Okay, yes. See, All I did write stuff. it down. I'm impressed. We've been talking for almost an hour and it's been great to chat with you. And I'm pretty sure that people will want to follow you on Twitter. Just remind me again what your Twitter name is. It's uh GM Andy J. Okay, great. And if they're interested in watching you try to assassinate the wrong people, is there a way? <laughs> can they can they find your Twitch yes. from from it's, Twitter? Is it easy enough? Or it's it's Game Master Andy J. Okay, it's pretty all much right, the then. same thing, but written all the way out. So, Andy, I want to say thank you very much for taking time out of a busy schedule. I'm excited to see what FASA come up with next and what you're going to be doing, and keep an eye on your Twitter for that. But thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And we're out. <laughs> okay, Nathan, from now on, it's all you. Oh, well, in that case, I'm keeping this part in. Anyway, we'll try our best and we'll see what we come up with. And then okay. I'll send it to Nathan. Nathan can work his magic editing stuff. He can take anything and get a good half an hour out of it. He's very, very talented. He's really fun. I like Nathan. I love, I love Nathan. Nathan was one of the guys... Um, the first contact I had with them was I went as a guest onto the onto the Delve podcast. But yeah, I instantly got on with Nathan. He's just—he's really nice. He's a nice guy. He's funny. I like his. He has a good ir- ironic take on life, um, which is always 
I find a help or something I can relate to. So yeah. Yeah. So there. It's on the record now. You can't take it back. Ha ha. 